Friendship Families, Happy New Year. Once again, welcome to 2021. I've been here waiting for you. <laughs> I know, I'm in a different place, right? <laughs> a new beginning and a fresh start. And today we're continuing on a new series. In this series, we are focusing on the Bible, the Word of God. The main thing we want to be sure that we know after these next few weeks is that the Bible tells me what God wants me to do through verses and stories about people and events. I know that's a lot. Here, let me put it on the screen. There it is. Now, let's read this together. The Bible tells me what God wants me to do through verses and stories about people and events. Good job, good job. And today we're going to be focusing on 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. And it says, summing it all up, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be humble. That goes for all of you. No exceptions, no retaliation, no sharp-tongued sarcasm. Instead, bless. That's your job to bless. You'll be a blessing and also get a blessing. I want you to think about that. We're gonna come back to it later on in our, in our time today. Now, it's time for our worship. Worship is a time set aside to get us to focus in on God, to think about His goodness and even express our love to Him in words and song and even movement and dance. <laughs> God will never stop chasing after us. He is faithful in everything he does. The promises he made, he keeps. His word is everlasting. Let's worship God together. Change. 
Amen. Amen. His word is everlasting. Now, the Bible is not just a regular book. It's a collection of verses and stories where God tells us about himself so we can know God better and he tells us how he wants us to act and think. Today, we'll be learning about making good choices and how it not only impacts us, but it impacts the people around us. We should love one another because God loved us first. Love is one of those words that I've talked about over 500 times in the Bible. It's talked about the most concerning God's love for us, but the love that we should have for one another is a common usage as well. Sometimes, when we don't act in a kind or loving way, we often justify it. We justify being mean or rude, or we might say that we acted the way that we did because someone else was mean or unkind to us. Revenge is not an excuse to be unkind to someone. Neither is someone who is hard to get along with. I mean, think about it. How many of you know someone who is just hard to get along with? Maybe that person is annoying. Maybe they're just too loud. They're self-conscious. They're mean to you. They're selfish or whatever it is. And there's usually one person in every group. And think about it. If there's not one in your group of friends, maybe it might be you. <laughs> but just because someone is difficult to get along with doesn't mean that they are not worthy of our kindness and our love and our treating them as we would want to be treated. The Bible encourages us, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be humble. That goes for all of you, all of us. No exceptions, no retaliation, no sharp-tongued sarcasm. Instead, bless. That's your job, to bless. You'll be a blessing, and also you'll get a blessing. And that's what I want us to focus on today, is how we can be a blessing to others. Now, it's time for our Bible story. Probably the hardest thing to do is for us to be kind to someone who has treated us badly. It takes self-control to honor God by learning to turn the other cheek. But in today's story, David is being sought out by Saul, the king. Saul is jealous of David and plans to kill him. Remember from our Bible story even last week? David, however, realizes that the king is anointed by God and he must not harm Saul. Twice, David has the opportunity to kill Saul. However, both times, David chooses to use self-control. He chooses to honor God. He chooses to trust God's word by sparing Saul's life and honoring him as king. But let's watch and listen to our Bible story. The Miracle of Mercy, David and Saul. This is David. Hey. David was a shepherd who lived in Israel. David was chosen by God to be the next king of Israel when he was just a boy. But David had to wait a very long time until that promise would come true because there was another king of Israel named Saul. Saul was strong and tall and looked like everything a king should be. But Saul did not follow God like he was supposed to. And for that reason, God chose to take the kingdom from Saul's family and give it to David's. David became a great warrior. Ah! And everyone in the kingdom loved David. Huh? This made Saul jealous and Saul hated David because he thought he would try to kill him and take the throne from his family. So Saul wanted to kill David. Whoa! Saul hunted David, but he couldn't catch him. One day, Saul heard that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul gathered 3,000 of his skilled fighters and went to find and kill David. 
During Saul's search for David, he went in a cave to relieve himself. Well, this very cave was the one where David and his men were hiding. And when David's men saw that Saul was unaware that David was there and unable to defend himself, they said, Now's your chance, David. This is God telling you that he will give you your enemy to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. But then David began to think that it was not right for him to take Saul's life. For no matter how much hardship and difficulty Saul had caused him, it was still not right for him to hurt the one who God had placed over Israel. So David told his men to back off, and he did not let them kill King Saul. They waited until after Saul had left the cave, and then David ran out of the cave and shouted after Saul, My king, why do you listen to people who say I am trying to harm you? Look, I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you've been hunting me. David went on to promise that he would never harm Saul. David said that God would be the one to protect David and to rescue him from Saul's power. Saul said, is that really you, David? And he began to cry. Saul said, You are a better man than I. You have been amazingly kind to me today, for when God put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would have done this? And now I realize that you are surely going to be king, and the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. But promise me that when that happens, you will not kill my family. So David promised that he would not hurt Saul's family, and they left each other in peace. Now Saul continued to cause difficulty in David's life. But David kept his promise, and in time, David did become king of Israel. David was dearly loved by God, and Israel did flourish under his rule because David did everything that God wanted him to do and he was a man after God's own heart. What a great Bible story. Remember, 1 Peter 3.8 tells us, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, and be humble. I want to challenge you in each of these things and to be nice. If you can't remember anything else, just be nice. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. If you can't be nice, at least don't be mean. If someone makes you mad, don't return anger for anger. Don't consider yourself responsible for revenge for a friend. It almost sounds too simplistic, but just be nice. Let's watch this segment from our friend Douglas from Douglas Talks. Today, we're going to be talking about the Golden Rule. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And, uh, well, I, I wanted to talk to you guys about something, and, you know, I guess I do this a lot where I make a mistake and then I come to you guys and I explain to you, you know, kind of what I learned. But, well, okay, I, I typically, I think of myself as a nice person. Okay, like I've got lots of friends and, and, and I, I share with my friends and stuff, you know, and, and I'm nice to them and stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty good person, but, um, well, I kind of got in a little bit of trouble and I realized maybe I need to rethink what it means to be a good person. So, well, actually, first let me talk to you about somebody who's not a good person. Okay, there's this kid at my school. His name is Asher and he is def he's definitely a bully. Okay, he is so mean, like he pushes people and he steals from people and he calls people names and he's just, he's just a mean, mean kid. But I found his kryptonite. I found his weakness because every day at lunch, he brings a Diet Coke with his lunch and he drinks from the Diet Coke. And I saw this video the other day on YouTube where if you take this thing called a Mentos, like it's like a, it's like a mint kind of thing and you put it into Diet Coke, something awesome happened. So what I did is I, I got some Mentos and I went over during lunch to where Asher was sitting 
And I said, hey, Asher, look over there. And he looked. And when he looked, I dropped the Mentos in his, in his Coke. And then when he looked back, the Coke exploded all up into his face. And there was Coke flying all over the place. And he was... It was all over him, and, and oh, man, it was so great. It was so perfect. If anybody deserved it, it was Asher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a mean kid, and so I thought, yeah, this is totally this is totally fair. He's a mean person, so I'm going to do something mean to him. Well, my uh, my principal did not really see it that way. So, uh, you know, I got called into the office, and I thought I was going to get yelled at for making a mess, but maybe he might even be like, hey, good job, Douglas. Asher is a punk. That was a good job. That was really funny. But no, he, he sat down, and I sat down, and he just looked at me. And he's got, this, he's got this big old mustache, and his mustache did not even move a little bit. It just sat there staring at me. And he said to me, he said, Douglas, that was unkind. And I thought, whoa, wait, no, no, I'm, I'm a nice person. I'm a kind person. Like, this, this was justice. You know, this, kindness has nothing to do with it. This was, just, this was just me getting back at somebody who's a jerk to everybody. And he said to me, he said, Douglas, do you know the golden rule? And I was like, uh, the golden rule? Um, is that the one where he who has all the gold makes the rules? And he said, nope, nope, it's not that, it's not that. He said, in the Bible, it says that we should do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And he said to me, he said, Douglas, would you like it? If someone sprayed the Coke in your face and everyone in the lunchroom made fun of you? And I thought to myself, well, no, I guess not. You know, who, who would want that? And he said to me, he said, and he's, he's a Christian. He's a good Christian man, you know, and, and, and I, I really kind of look up to him. But he said, God doesn't just want us to show kindness to our friends. God wants us to be kind to everyone, especially those who are not kind to us. And so, yeah, you know, I got in trouble with the principal and, and, and I got a letter sent home to my parents and, and I had to go apologize to Asher and all that. But, but beyond just, you know, the, the typical punishments they gave me, I, I felt really, really bad inside. I did. I felt really bad because I knew that I was not living up to, to what God had planned for me. I was not living up to the example that Jesus, Jesus left for us. You know, Jesus was God. Jesus is God. And when Jesus was walking around here on earth, there were people who were really, really mean to him. But he still showed kindness to them. He died even for them. So I know for me that I, I want to live up to the golden rule. I want to show people the kindness that, that I would like to be shown. Even if they're really mean, even if they're not nice to me at all, I still want to show God's love, God's kindness to everyone. And that's my challenge to you guys is that you would follow the golden rule and that you would do to others as you would have them do to you. We too have the opportunity to show self-control when dealing with others. But doing what is right instead of following our own impulses, we honor God. We must approach all of our relationships with self-control and compassion just as David modeled in our story. After all, Jesus died for our sins in the ultimate show of mercy. Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, let's join host Jack Beck, and he takes us into the Judean wilderness where David hid from King Saul in a cave. I think it is so cool and really makes the true Bible story come to life. Let's check it out. Do you think everything in the Bible is there for a reason? Even its unrecognizable place names? I've spent nearly 30 years studying this question. Join me to experience how the regions of the Holy Land are part of the story. I'm Jack Beck, and this is the Holy Land. Are you ready? One, two, three. See if this is a good picture for you. Are you guys on vacation? I love it. Do you know there's a Bible story here? No. For Samuel 24, the story of David and Saul. So you remember when David was... You got it. So David's running away from Saul, and he's trying to find a place that he can hide out, and he comes here and gets tucked into a cave. The cave. Where's the cave? Boom, you have it, the cave. 
first. I love to share my love for the land and the stories of this place. I've been coming to Israel for over 25 years, and I regularly run into people that are unaware of the Bible stories that have taken place all around them. So many locations throughout this land play an essential role in giving a richer understanding of the scriptures. Now, I'm a firm believer in taking nothing but photographs and leaving nothing but footprints. Well, almost nothing. Normally, wilderness is defined as a place devoid of people. But just look at all the tourists flocking to this desert oasis. You guys good for water? Uh, yes, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I kicked my water bottle off the top of this ridge. It took off and it bounced a couple of times and went airborne and disappeared over. So I didn't hear a scream, so uh, I'm really... We'll keep an eye out. It's easy to see why when you visit this gem of a location called En Gedi on the western shore of the Dead Sea. During the time of King Saul and David, there were more wild goats in this valley than people. And most of their day was spent on the vertical cliffs. But they came down to drink water at the spring, and that is why this place was called En Gedi. In Hebrew, Spring of the Wild Goats. The wilderness generally lacks water, and Gedi is unique in this respect. David and his small band of men came here for water, and they also hid here among the caves of this natural fortress. The story of Saul and David is a Judean wilderness story, and my goodness, this ecosystem is hostile. I mean, really hostile to the human experience. There's an absence of food here. There's very, very little water in this place. Hey, guys. It's a place where travel is incredibly, incredibly difficult and risky uh, because of falls of, off terrain and because of large predators. David wasn't out here. Hi, guys. David wasn't out here because it was easy. Uh, David was out here in this place because it was hard. It was a place for him to escape from Saul as Saul was trying to take his life. Before the wilderness years, David was a shepherd boy tending his father's flock when God sent the prophet Samuel to anoint him, prophesying that he would one day be king. Imagine the dreams and aspirations this planted in David's mind. Later, while still a young shepherd, David brought food to Saul's army when the Israelites were threatened by the giant Philistine Goliath. David offered to fight him, proclaiming, Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Through David, God brought the Israelites a great victory that day. Saul kept a jealous eye on David from that day forward, fearing he might lose his power and kingdom to this shepherd boy upstart. Now David had come out here to escape, to get away from Saul, but the Lord had the same plan for David in this ecosystem that he had for ancient Israel when they were wandering in the Sinai and wilderness of Zin. The truth of the matter is, when the Lord takes you into wilderness, you do not come out the same person. Exactly how did this barren wilderness shape David? Just before David won the battle and all Israel sang his praises, his brother Eliab reacted, Why have you come down here? I know how conceited you are. You came down here to watch the battle. Perhaps Eliab spoke out of jealousy, thinking David was moved by his youthful presumption and dreams of leading Israel. But now, after almost 10 years as a fugitive, God was using the wilderness to shape him into the kind of leader who would be completely dependent on the Lord. 7 times in seven different places, Saul had attempted to take David's life. David correctly concluded there was only one step between him and death, and so he fled out into the folds of the Judean wilderness to hide. It worked until the day he ended up in the En Gedi spring area, deep in a cave with Saul's soldiers outside. It's at that moment that David does two things that seemed totally irrational. 
you, you need to see it from the perspective of his soldiers. His soldiers would tuck back in the inner recesses of the cave, their backs up against the wall. Their only escape route was going through Saul's army where they were outnumbered five to one. They did not want to be discovered. Their only safety is their secrecy, and so they're hiding in here. Suddenly they see David on the move. David, sword in hand, begins to move towards the mouth of the cave. He disappears out of sight. And then he comes back, and what he has in his hand is a piece of the royal garment of Saul. Saul must have been in the cave. His men were furious with him. They said, why didn't you take his life? And then David does the second thing they can't understand. He walks towards the opening of the cave. He comes out again, and they can hear from the inside that he's calling out to Saul and shouting his direction, giving their position away. Everything that David was doing seemed totally irrational to them. David called out from the mouth of the cave to Saul, not to gloat, not to show off, but to declare his allegiance to Saul, even calling him the Lord's anointed. David had learned to trust the timing of God's future for him. Taking Saul's life was not the way for David to become king. Instead, David chose to surrender completely to God, no matter what the consequences might be. And what was Saul's response to David? You are a better man than I am, for you have repaid me good for evil. And now I realize that you are surely going to be king and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. David's humble response was so powerful that even his enemy took notice and changed. David was closer than ever to being king of Israel and the wilderness helped shape him to be the kind of leader the Lord needed him to be. It just reminds me of how seasons in the wilderness that I've lived through or will live through are defeatable, conquerable, are survivable because I've seen David go out into that wilderness and be made better for it. That is the kind of vision I try to keep when I walk into a season of wilderness, believing that somehow the Lord will improve who I am on the backside, just like he did David. Wow, that was so awesome. This week, I want you to pay close attention to your niceness. If you find yourself being rude, mean, vengeful, inconsiderate, or unkind, stop and pray that God will help you to show kindness. Let people know that you belong to Jesus because you are kind to everyone with whom you come into contact. God bless you. Have a great week.